Advent. We're pleased to see everyone here. We have a few announcements to start with. Gina. Good morning. This Friday, December 3rd, the Women's Fellowship is getting together here to make blankets to donate to the homeless. We'll be getting together at six and there's dinner. There's a sign up. The kids. Thanks. Kathleen. Good morning. Just wanted to announce that our clothing drive um, has been a huge success. We exceeded our goal. We have 187 bags and boxes. So um, thank you to everybody for helping. And we're all set for this coming Saturday. I do have a backup volunteer, but if anybody is available 11 to 1 here at the church, Saturday the 4th, would love to have you come. Otherwise, we're okay. And we hope to raise $500 is the expectation for the church. Um, there is an unclaimed clothes in the closet that I'm told um, have been here for one year. So the rule of thumb is if you don't wear it in a year, then that's it, it's gone. So I'm donating them, but if one of your clothing items happens to be hanging in the closet, please come see me after the service and they're in a specially marked bag and you can have it back. Otherwise it's um, gonna count uh, 188 bags. Um, and that's it, thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, Linda, please. Good morning. Um, first of all, uh, the deacons are still collecting for the college care packages. So if you'd like to purchase a gift card for that, Barb Walker after church. And uh, we have our annual Covenant to Care Christmas display. It's not a tree right now, but... Um, and for those of you who do not know, we sponsor, we kind of adopt a social worker from DCF, Department of Children and Families, and we help with his caseload throughout the year. And we've done this Christmas drive for years and years and years. So um, what you do is you just pick a tag and on it, we have a list of all the clients and kind of there a little bit about them. But this one says, Marissa is 18 years old. She's attending UMass in Boston and majoring in psychology. And I know for a fact that Santo, our caseworker, moved her into college. So that just gives you a little idea, moving into college without your parents, you know. So anyway, Marissa, some gift card suggestions, Walmart, CVS, Best Buy, or Target. So there are suggestions on here. Gift cards are such a good gift for adolescents and young adults. They get to pick out what they want and we do it through scripts so the church um, benefits financially as well. So see us in the chapel room after church, thank you. Liz. Good morning. This is short, um, or I'm tall. Um, I just want to remind everybody today is our hanging of the greens event. So I'm inviting everybody to stay after church for a little potluck. We'll have a little fellowship. And then we're going to come in here. We're going to decorate the church for our first Sunday of Advent through our Christmas season. I'm looking forward to it. I need a couple extra strong arms. So I'm hoping some of you are able to stay. And um, thank you. Thanks, Liz. Any other announcements? Yes, George. This Mike. Uh, we are recording and uh, posting the entire service now on our uh, YouTube page. Uh, the only way we can get the joys and concerns is if we use a microphone. So I'm going to ask you to all uh, kind of put up with this. And Can you get the microphone, please? Thank you. Uh, one other announcement we have. Uh, December 14th is um, uh, food share uh, at the uh, town hall. In the last several years, we have been supplying cookies and coffee and hot chocolate and using the big room, you know, where you vote in their uh, setting up. Uh, we're looking for people to help that day. Um, it starts around eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, we're out of there by noon all the time. Uh, we also need uh, some bakers. It'd be nice to just uh, bring cookies and, and treats like that. 
So uh, I don't think I left anything out. So hopefully you can uh, have some time on that Tuesday morning and give us a hand. Thank you. Bonnie. I just want to remind everyone uh, that we are in our pledge season. So if you haven't turned in your pledge card, please do so. Thanks. And also, uh, lastly, I think uh, uh, Kathleen Ford, uh, member, new member of the congregation, will be lighting our first Advent candle this morning. My name is David Dixon. As a member of the Board of Deacons of our church, I'd like to welcome you, welcome you all to this morning's worship service. Now, please allow the lighting of the altar candles and the ringing of the bell to invite you into silent prayer and meditation as we prepare ourselves to worship our God. Perhaps the, uh, the last announcement that, uh, that we have overlooked is actually the biggest of them all. And that is that uh, last, last week we said uh, goodbye to Reverend Joe Tobin. And this week we uh, give a warm welcome to Reverend Daniel Cohen, uh, who will be with us through Advent, his wife, Christine, and his beautiful granddaughter, Miracle. Join us now in the call to worship. God, as we enter this season full of hope, help us, Lord, to live lives worthy of you. Help us, Lord, to accept Christ in us. Help us, Lord, to live as holy as we can. Help us, Lord, to worship you. And now we'll have the lighting of the Advent candle. The Advent reading is found in the insert in your leaflet. We have endured these past few years and know that there is more to face before us. We don't know if we have the strength to withstand what might be around the next corner. And we wonder who will stand with us, who will have our back, who will occupy our corner. That is what for these days. Who will light our way and chart our course? Who is on our side? Who will welcome us home again? Home. The prophet Jeremiah speaks of a branch that will be raised. Jesus spoke of a son of man that will descend. Both point to a hope, a hope that calls us home, our true home, where we're welcomed and loved and included where there is justice and equality and peace. It's time this Advent season, time to go home. We light this candle as a sign of our hope, our strong hope that there is a way to go home, to the home in Christ. And it starts with us, and it starts here, and it starts now. It's time to go home. Would you please uh, join us in the gathering hymn, Give the Winds Thy Fears, 338. Mm -hmm. 
Praise the Lord. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we welcome you into this place, this holy place of worship, this holy temple where we come week in and week out to venerate you. Father God, we ask you to be present with us, the body of Christ, as we enter this season of Advent. Bless us with your presence, even as you blessed the world with the presence of your son 2,000 years ago. Amen. And we recite the Lord's Prayer together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. At this time, we have our call to confession. Jesus came into this world so that we could be forgiven for our sins. Let us confess them now freely. We know that we are not perfect, nor should we try to be, for perfection belongs to you alone. Yet, Lord, help us to strive to live as holy as we know how. Lord, you know how we've fallen short in our Christian mission over the past week. And Lord, we ask your forgiveness. Help us, Lord, to love ourselves even despite our failures. Just as you love the world so much that you gave your only begotten son for us so many generations ago. Amen. Almighty God, who pardons all who truly repent, forgive our sins, strengthen us by the Holy Spirit, and keep us in life eternal through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Now, the glory. Yeah. 
Please be seated. And we're going to have our hymn number 463, Praise, O oh, Praise Our God and King. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Thanks, Miracle. That's my granddaughter. She's going to be preaching today. <laughs> so um, at this point, we're going to share our joys and concerns. Uh, so whatever it is that you want to celebrate today or any concerns that you have, uh, I'm going to be doing it a little differently than Reverend Tobin. I'm going to be standing up here. Uh, my hearing's not perfect, so George is going to hand you the mic. Uh, plus, that will be better for online. And uh, I will take down and pray for you the shares and joys and concerns after we're done. Okay? Um, please continue to pray for my dad. He's back in the hospital again with kidney failure. And uh, he also has congestive heart failure. So just pray for him that he may be peaceful. Amen. Pulpit today. <laughs> Welcome. Oh, prayer and joy for you being here today to fill our pulpit. Welcome. I think you should wait to hear the sermon before you do that. <laughs> we're, we're ahead of ourselves. <laughs> well, uh, a prayer of, uh, I think, celebration for a couple of our. Uh, high school members who are inductees into the National Honor Society, Chris Deeb and Lucas uh, Bushko. Who 
Brooks uh, graduated with honors. Lucas Bushka. Okay, thank you. I, I want to uh, have a special joy that for Barbara and for all people that are caretakers of their elderly parents. Um, it's very hard work and it's very stressful. Uh, prayers of joy and love for my daughter, Stacy, who celebrated her birthday yesterday. Prayers for our college students that are getting ready for all of their finals. They are our future, so uh, go team. <laughs> A prayer for all of our men and women in the military and their families. I have a prayer of joy that uh, uh, my daughters Taylor and Amanda were able to spend Thanksgiving together. And uh, uh, since she's moved away, this is the first time they've seen each other in the last three months, face to face. and. Uh, they seem to have had a good time and didn't kill each other. <laughs> Are there any more? Okay, at this time, let us pray. Lord, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, and we ask you, Lord, to bless all of us here, Lord. And right now, Lord, we lift up, Lord. Yes, Lord, the young lady's dad and her, who's having the kidney failure, Lord, and the heart issues, Lord. We ask you, Lord, to heal him, Lord. Yes, Lord, for you are a healer, Lord. And we believe in you, Lord, and we believe in prayer, Lord. And we ask you, Lord, to work on him, Lord, in a mighty way. Lord, we lift up the high school member who was inducted into the National Honor Society, Lucas Bushka, and we wish him all the best, and we wish him great things in the future, in Jesus' name. Lord, we lift up Barbara, Lord, and all the caretakers of elderly parents, Lord. Lord, you know all about them. It's a long and difficult struggle sometimes, but it is truly a ministry. Lord, we lift up the daughter Stacy, Lord, and her birthday. Congratulations, Stacy and the college students who are taking their finals, and they are the future. Lord, we lift up the military, Lord, and their families, Lord. You know that they sacrifice as well, sometimes giving the ultimate sacrifice on the field of battle. Lord, we lift up the daughters of George Fetzer, Lord, Taylor and Amanda, and we thank God that they did not kill each other. <laughs> Amen. Otherwise, I'd have to do a funeral. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm hoping everybody stays healthy during Advent. <laughs> so at this time, uh, let me just uh, invite, give an invitation to generosity. Uh, so let us present with joy our offerings of commitment and support for the work of Christ's church.
that this gift be used for the upbuilding of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. The scripture reading this morning is from Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. May God add his blessing to our understanding of these words from the Holy Scripture. Give an honor to God who is the head of my life, to all of you who came out this morning to hear a word from the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, we ask you to bless this sermon, pour down your wisdom from heaven, remove everything that is in Daniel and let your spirit shine through. Bless the ears that hear it, in Jesus' name, amen. Before I begin my sermon, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Reverend Daniel Aaron Cohen, and I'm going to be your temporary pastor for the season of Advent, starting today and continuing through Christmas Eve. You can feel free to call me Reverend Daniel or Reverend Cohen or Pastor Daniel or Pastor Cohen or even just plain Daniel. In fact, you can call me just about anything you like, but don't call me late for dinner. <laughs> Christine is an excellent cook, by the way. <laughs> so while there is much I can tell you about myself, I don't believe in prolonged sermons, especially prolonged bad sermons, as that qualifies as cruel and unusual punishment. <laughs> so let me just give you the most pertinent facts about me as they pertain to today's worship service. I come from a church that worships in the African-American tradition. So while I respect your church culture and won't be doing any cartwheels up here or expecting you to jump up and shout hallelujah or yes, Lord, I will ask you humbly to respond with a head nod, a smile, or even an occasional amen, should you feel the desire to do so. This lets me know three things. One, that you heard and agree with what I said. Two, that you want to encourage me to continue, and three, that you're still awake. Amen. <laughs> I was promised one of those at the deacon's meeting. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so now that we've gotten that out of the way, today as we start Advent with the theme of hope, I wanna preach on the subject, hope for the future, with the subtitle, Help is right around the corner. Today, I wanna to open up our season of Advent with a scripture of hope. As we've already heard, Jeremiah 29 and 11 states, for surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet, which is in some ways appropriate this holiday season as some of us may find this time bittersweet. Having lost one's loved ones to COVID and other circumstances, 
loved ones who we can no longer share the holidays with. And this is but one of the many ways the pandemic has disrupted our lives. Jeremiah lived in difficult times too. Furthermore, he had the unpleasant duty of warning the Jewish people that they would be defeated in battle and exiled to Babylon, an exile that began roughly 586 years before Jesus' birth. At that time, King Nebuchadnezzar sacked the holy city of Jerusalem, destroyed the temple King Solomon had built for God, took its inhabitants captive, and shipped them off to Babylon. The words we are reading from Jeremiah 29 and 11 today are the words God spoke to Jeremiah to send back to the people in Babylon after they had been taken captive, just as Jeremiah had foretold. At the time of Jeremiah 29 and 11, Jeremiah had just heard from God that the people would be in exile for 70 years before they would be able to return to Jerusalem. So while the bad news was that they would have to wait several generations before they would be restored to their homeland, the good news was that they had hope for the future, that while the people in exile couldn't see when they would ever be free again, God sent them hope for the future from the prophet Jeremiah. Can I get an amen? amen. Uh, I'm feeling good. <laughs> I'm in the right place, all right. <laughs> How many of you know that while the chosen people of Israel couldn't see around the corner to the day when they'd be back in the holy city of Jerusalem, God provided hope for the future? What does this verse have to do with the birth of Christ? We'll get to that before the sermon ends, I promise. You see, friends, while we can't see around corners, God can and does do exactly that. Each of us has a destiny a plan for our lives that only God knows, a plan that is destined to work out for our good and for God's glory. Maybe today you're facing something challenging and you have no idea how you're going to make it through. Maybe you have some dream for your life and you can't see how God is going to make it happen. Or maybe you're just sad that your pastor of 19 years is no longer here. If that's you today, I've got good news. Take hope, help is right around the corner. You see, friends, the interesting thing about corners is that we can't see around them. Life is like that too. No one knows what is going to happen in the future. Yes, we plan for this and that, and sometimes it looks as if we can see what's coming up in our lives, but ultimately everything in the future is something that's around a corner we cannot see, no matter how much we wish we could. This is particularly true when we're facing a difficult situation. For when all else seems lost, when you're at your lowest point, just remember that we serve a God that can see around corners that we can't. A God who specializes in turning our trials into triumphs. A God that gives us hope. This morning, I wanna to talk to you about three ways to conquer your fears and give you hope for the future and to remind you that while you may not be able to see it now, God has a special blessing for you right around the corner. Point number one, remember the previous trials and how God brought you through each one of them. While you may have some scars from the trials you have been through, the fact is you got through them. Remember that time you lost your job or you didn't have any money or some other misfortune befell you. That time when circumstances looked so bleak, you were even thinking of ending your life. Has anyone in here ever been depressed? If so, you're in good company because all of us get depressed sometimes. Oswald Chambers, the author of the outstanding daily devotional, My Utmost for His Highest, says that it is the nature of a crystal not to be depressed. Being human, comes with both the highs and the lows. Does anyone in here know what I'm talking about? You see, friends, trials come for many reasons. They come because we live in a fallen world. They come so that we can appreciate our fellow Christians' pain. They come because they help us identify with what Jesus went through. 
But perhaps most of all, trials come to build our character. Back before I gained all this weight, yeah, back then, I was a serious tennis player. Now, when you're playing a match and returning serve, you're often hoping the other person will double fault and you're gonna get an easy point. But how many of you know that you never remember those times when the other guy double faulted? It's those times that you had to make a difficult decision and succeeded. Those times when you realized you had no choice but to gamble and it paid off. It's those times that you remember most vividly. That's because trials, when properly looked at, are really opportunities. Opportunities to test our mettle. Opportunities to grow stronger. Opportunities to show God how much we trust him. You see, I believe God gets the greatest joy when we trust him in our greatest trial. The goal is to look at the trials the way a surfer looks at the waves. The bigger, the better. When we look at our trials as something God is going to work out, we realize that while we can't always see how he is going to do it, that is, we can't see around the corner to where our blessing is, we can trust that somehow, some way, that blessing will appear. Can I get another amen? amen? You see, my fellow believers in Christ, it's only natural that we get upset when a new trial first comes our way. But after a while, we should get our heads straight. I said, after a while, we should come to our senses and remember Romans 8 and 28, that all things, not some things, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose. Then we can rejoice and see those trials as things that God allowed to build us up. This leads me to the second way we can overcome our fears and stay hopeful when facing a trial. Keep you in suspense. <laughs> Point number two, remember the times God answered your prayers. The second thing we should think about when facing trials is how God brought us through them in the past. In particular, how God answered prayer. Two incidents from my personal history come to mind. And although they were somewhat trivial compared to some things we pray for, they stand out in my mind. I remember my 50th birthday party nine years ago. That morning, I woke up to rain. And it looked at, I looked at the weather report on my phone, which stated that there was a 30% chance of a thunderstorm every hour that my party was supposed to take place. Panicking, I immediately started calculating like a madman. If the chance of rain was 30% for each hour of a five hour party, what were the chances it would rain during one of those hours? 30 times five, I reasoned, or 150%. <laughs> Now, I know that doesn't make sense, but I was doing the math in mortal terror, afraid that my party would be ruined if it rained at all, as there wasn't room enough for 80 people in my house and on the patio. And mind you, I think this is the only birthday party I had since I was 10. So this was important to me. At that point, consumed as I was with a calculation madness that affected my mind like rabies, I put out the text that the party was canceled and would have to be held the next day due to the weather. Instead of walking in faith and hope, I was calculating without God in mind. That is, my mind was imagining the worst case scenario, a packed house full of people, standing room only with myself unable to furnish the promised entertainment. No folk singing, no male chorus, no music whatsoever. In short, a horrible social fiasco. My big 50th birthday party. Less a celebration marking a milestone than a terrible letdown for myself and everyone I invited. Fortunately for me, God spoke to me through my wife and one of the church mothers, who reminded me that there were other parties planned for Sunday that the delicious food my wife prepared wouldn't be so scrumptious the day after. 
So I decided to bite the bullet and pray with all my might that it would stop raining and clear up during the day. And you know, that's exactly what God did for me. God had seen around the corner and there were no puddles to be found. Amen. Amen. Another such blessing occurred at the beach in Cape Cod a few years ago when I jumped in the ocean, get this, with my glasses on. <laughs> Shows you how stupid someone who is supposedly educated can be, right? Naturally, they fell off and sunk to the bottom of the sea. When I realized what happened, I searched frantically, but to no avail. So I got Christine and my son Samuel, and we prayed we would find them. And in less than five minutes, my wife pulled her foot above the surface with my glasses, <laughs> these same glasses, between her toes. <laughs> Won't God do it? Think about all the times God has come through for you when you were afraid he wasn't going to. Now think about whatever is troubling you right now. Whatever you're thinking about that you think God isn't going to help you handle. Everything that you can't quite see in front of you. Everything that's around the corner. It's a trick of the enemy to make you think God doesn't know all about you and your trials. That's why we need to keep a faith journal. If you're not already doing so, I'd invite you to start. Then you can look back at it when you need to be reminded that God is with you and always has been. Friends, I'll bet if you think on it hard enough, you'll come to see that God was with you in so many ways you can't begin to count them. And it's not just the big things either. One of the greatest blessings God gives us is what psychologist Carl Jung called synchronicity or what church folk often call confirmation. It's when some special coincidence that's too coincidental to have happened by chance. Like those times you had a particular issue and the pastor spoke on it over and over again. Or you had a verse in your head and you went to church and the preacher preached on that very same verse. Does anybody in here have that happen? Amen. You see, my friends, sometimes God lets us know that he's with us in the smallest, most intimate ways. The Bible tells us that God, has, who created the heavens and the earth, has numbered the very hairs on our head. That is, God knows all about us and everything we're going through, and that somehow all of our trials are working out for our good. Friends, I've had countless times when I felt God winking at me through coincidences. Coincidences that I, in my sanctified foolishness, take to be a sign from God that he knows all about me and is actively involved in my life. Times when I'll hear a word or a phrase I haven't heard in years and then hear it again less than an hour later or some other remarkable coincidence will occur. One morning when I was wondering how I was going to face the day ahead of me, it dawned on me that I was not alone that God was engineering my circumstances and that he would be with me and put people in my path that would help me meet my needs and achieve my goals. It was February 3rd, which was significant in that when I went to read one of my other daily devotionals, Sarah Young's Jesus Calling, it started out with the sentence, I am with you and for you, you face nothing alone, nothing. Then there was the time when I went to my aunt's boyfriend's funeral. For some reason unknown to me, they gave each person who attended a sand dollar, those little crustacean things that you get. Anyway, the very next day, without me saying one word about it, one of my clients, I'm a psychotherapist as well as a preacher, <clears throat> a much better psychotherapist than a preacher, by the way, <laughs> who attended, uh, the next day, without me saying one word about it, one of my clients at the homeless shelter started talking to me about the spiritual significance of sand dollars. This was a striking coincidence, as I hadn't thought of or heard anyone mention sand dollars in years. Coincidence? Perhaps. But as a famous theologian once said, the more I pray, the more coincidences seem to happen. 
If the second way we can maintain hope through our trials is to remember answered prayer, the third and final way we can trust God when we can't see around the corner is to look at the Bible stories of how God stepped in when all looked lost. Point number three, look at the Bible. We all know the story of how God told Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. Isaac was the son of promise, the rightful heir through whom God promised to make Abraham a great nation. A promise God gave Abraham 25 years before Isaac was born. So when God asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, it was as if God were asking Abraham to sacrifice not only his son, but his dreams as well. What do you think was going through Abraham's mind when he heard God tell him to sacrifice his only rightful heir? the son of promise. While the Bible doesn't tell us what Abraham was thinking as he climbed Mount Moriah to sacrifice Isaac, as a parent and a grandparent, I feel certain that Abraham was hoping that somehow, in some way that he could not foresee, God would intervene on his son's behalf. After all, unlike God, Abraham couldn't see around the corner. So although it was the last thing in the world any parent would want to do, Abraham was obedient to God. He took Isaac with him to the mountaintop, tied him up, and was about to sacrifice his son when the angel of the Lord suddenly appeared and called down from him in heaven, don't harm the boy, the angel said. And just like that, God provided a ram stuck in the thicket for Abraham to sacrifice instead. How many of you know that until Abraham saw him, that ram was right around the corner? Speaking of corners, how would you have felt if you were in Moses' shoes when he and the people of Israel were cornered as Pharaoh's chariots came toward them with their back to the Red Sea? At the time, he must have been thinking that his only choices were to be killed by Pharaoh's army or to drown in the sea. Yet Moses knew God so well that like Abraham, he trusted that God would come through for him and rescue the children of Israel. He had hope that, despite how things looked in the natural, that God would, in the supernatural, show up and give him a happy ending. And as we all know, God did just that, parting the Red Sea so that the Israelites could pass through on dry ground, and then reversing the process and drowning Pharaoh's army as they chased after them. And while there are many such stories throughout the Bible, let me close by relating the most important example of how God sees around corners that you and I cannot. I'm talking about the birth of Jesus. You see, my friends, going back to our scripture in Jeremiah, while the exiled Israelites had to wait 70 years to return to Jerusalem and be back in God's good graces, the world was waiting for Jesus' birth from the beginning of history. That my Bible tells me that when sin entered into the human race through Adam and Eve's sin in the Garden of Eden, it ruined our relationship with God. That is until, I said until, the promised coming of the Messiah. Jesus' birth was the fulfillment of the hope of all the prophets of the Old Testament, the first part of the Bible, which was completed 400 years before Jesus came down from glory to be born in a manger. And while this morning we look toward, forward to Jesus' birth, we do so not only because God came down and dwelt with us in the flesh, but because God was willing that his only begotten son will be sacrificed on Calvary's cross so that we could be forgiven for our sins. That while on that awful day on Calvary, when Jesus' followers thought he all was lost and couldn't see around the corner to his resurrection and ascension, God had a plan for our good. Can I get my last amen, church? Amen. My brothers, my sisters, how many of you know that Jesus' birth and sacrifice give each one of us hope that one day we will be with him in heaven. I don't know about you, my friends, but it is my most fervent hope that one fine day, thanks to what Jesus did, 
and my obedience in accepting him as my Lord and Savior, I will one day hear God say, well done, my good and faithful servant, well done. And then I will be ushered into heaven. Right now, I'd like, you, I'd like to close by asking you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Remind yourself that whatever you are going through personally today, our scripture says that God has a plan for you, a plan for your welfare and not hurt, a plan to give you a future with hope, that God had a plan for the human race, even from the beginning of time, to send down his son to redeem the world. And that same God has a plan for your life, that while you may not be able to see it, just as we can't see around the corner, God can and does know all about us. Let us pray. Lord, in Jesus' name, help us to have hope and realize that you are with us wherever we go. The hope that comes from recognizing that you created not only us, but our circumstances as well. That while we may not know what's coming around the bend, you know all about it. That while we can't see around corners, you have already mapped out what we're going to face and how we're going to get the victory, giving you the glory in the process. Lord, we're asking you today to strengthen our faith and fill us with a renewed sense of hope. Whatever we are going through personally, we give it over to you, Lord, and we refuse to worry about it anymore. Thank you, Father, for being a God who sees around corners and gives us hope for the future. Thank you and amen. Right now, there might be one who does not know Christ or one who feels they have backslidden and want to reestablish their relationship with God. Whether that's someone here in the sanctuary or someone watching the service online, I want you to know that Jesus is waiting, that God loves you, if you feel called to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, just repeat after me. Lord, I am a sinner in need of salvation. I turn my life over to you. I believe you are the Son of God and that you died on a cross for my sins and that you were raised again on the third day, conquering death and hell. Finally, if there's anyone here who does not have a church home, and wants to join this body of believers, I ask you to come now. Is there one? Amen. God bless you all. Now we're going to have our closing hymn, Standing in the Need of Prayer, from SH89.
Father God, we thank you for this time to worship together. We ask you, Lord, to bless each of us as we go to our separate homes. Help us, Lord, to find them just as we left them, Lord. And help us, Lord, to be better Christians, Lord, each and every day. And help us, Lord, to share our faith with others that someone may ask, what must I do to be saved? In Jesus' name, amen. amen.